full access to RFR only on Patreon. Become a member of the RFR Patreon community to get more Rebel Force Radio. Bonus shows and content are available right now only at patreon.com slash rebel force radio. Where the fun begins. A long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away. This is Rebel Force Radio. Your source for the Force. Star Wars news and commentary. With Jason Swank and Jimmy Mack. I've seen Star Wars 500 times. Star Wars number one. This station is now the ultimate power in the universe. I suggest we use it. Now it's time for Rebel Force Radio. We would be honored if you would join us. Hello. What do you mean you're not going to be able to make it? Well, what happened to you? Do we do we need to post bail again? But you're you're okay and everything. Okay. All right, man. No, we'll just go ahead and do the show without you. I wish you'd be able to hang with us. Hey, that sounds fun to me. All right, man. Well, we'll catch up in a couple of weeks. Okay. All right. Hey, Star Wars fans, Jimmy Mack here with you, and welcome to Rebel Force Radio for Friday, February 22nd, 2019. You may have noticed it's not the usual voice that you typically hear at the beginning of all Rebel Force Radio episodes, but we got no swank. As a matter of fact, Jason's going to be out for a couple of weeks. He uh, has some uh, uh, things to deal with professionally. And uh, Jason is a hardworking guy, and uh, these things happen uh, to a guy of his stature, his executive stature. These things happen once or twice a year, and uh, he'll be back with us in a couple of weeks. But have no fear, we're bringing you RFR. Have no fear, RFR is here. And uh, I, of course, am Jimmy Mack. And from Chicago, my good friend and yours, Billy Mack. Hey, how you doing, everybody? Hey, hey, hey. So let's just cut to the chase. Um, Puppet Lando is in the house. He's in the box. (laughs) Let me out. But I don't know about you guys, but for me, the best part about Puppet Lando is listening to Swank just go insane over everything that Puppet Lando (laughs) says. And so I don't want to necessarily... Deprive Swank of the, uh, the. Uh, I mean, you know, he's like borderline brain aneurysm sometimes, I think, when he's <laughs> laughing so hard. I think he's going to burst a vein or something. But uh, that, to me, makes Puppet Lando so much more funny. So Puppet Lando is going to stay in the box for uh, this show. But we do have big plans for Puppet Lando in Chicago this April. And we'll talk a little bit about that in just a few minutes. But just so you soothe our our Jones, our Puppet Lando Jones, Billy Mac. Yeah. Can you provide it? If if I pointed an iron cannon at you right now and said, <laughs> you better say something as Puppet oh, Lando, hey. or else I'm going to open yeah. fire. Now, uh, well, one don't just open so, fire on me. <laughs> so what? Do you have one message for uh, Rebel Force Radio listeners this week, Puppet Lando? Well, just be <laughs> responsible. That's the price you pay for being successful. Okay. That's like a little Lando fortune cookie right there. You know, if, if Lando you know, manufactured his own fortune cookies, he'd probably have witticisms and sayings like that. You know, words of wisdom, what have you. Attention, this is Lando Calrissian. And, of course, debuting at Toy Fair over the weekend... The Lando Calrissian Talking Doll. When we find Jabba the Hutt and that bounty hunter, we'll contact you. Make your toy box cool with Lando. Oh, he's not after you at all. He's after somebody called a Skywalker. Just keep him away from Barbie. Hello, what have we here? Be the coolest kid on the block with Talking Lando. When we find Jabba the Hutt and that bounty hunter, 
We'll contact you. <laughs> All right. So no Jason. Uh, that means we had to postpone our Toy Fair 2019 coverage. We wanted to break down all of the cool Star Wars reveals that happened at that trade show in New York last weekend, including the reintroduction of vintage action figures. And I'm not just talking about the card backs, but I'm talking about the action figures themselves. That's an important discussion. That is an important discussion. I'm not going to tip my hat as to what my opinion is either way. Um, you may have seen me say something about it on social media. I can't remember. I've been very busy with social media over the course of the last couple of weeks and, uh, having a good time. <laughs> yeah. I, I think those were, in te- I think they, uh, they were texts to me. Oh, I don't, they were I don't texts. think you actually went online yet. You know, that's the weirdest thing. Espoused. Yeah. You know, some of my greatest Twitter feeds happen only as, uh, iPhone texts to, to Billy Mac and Jason. But, but no, I, I have, you know, everyone has um, opinions when you're a Star Wars collector and you've been collecting for 40 plus years. So uh, we'll, we'll talk about all the cool Star Wars Toy Fair reveals when Jason returns. I have good news for you, my lord. That's good news. Come closer, I have good news. All right, as far as Star Wars news this week, I I really don't think we're going to be getting any big news until Star Wars Celebration Chicago in April, but uh, a lot of rumor this week, rumored streaming service series for the new uh, Disney Plus platform. Uh, There's rumors about streaming series in production now for just about every character you could possibly imagine in Star Wars. I mean, they're, they're, they're popping up all over the place. You know, there's going to be a series about Poe. There's going to be a series about Finn, a series about Phasma, a series about Rose and everything. So, I mean, that's just all over the place. Take it with a grain of salt. The latest one I saw was the uh, Kenobi streaming series. Ring any bells? Hear anyone actually say they wanted to see that a long, long time ago? Uh, well, it could be this guy. It looks like that could actually be something that's being considered to develop into a streaming series. I think a lot of the scrapped film ideas are going to be somehow reincorporated into streaming series for Disney+. Plus. I think Disney's putting a lot of eggs into that basket. It's top priority for Bob Iger to create a platform that could immediately start competing with Netflix, and he wants to create a lot of original content to populate that service. So it only makes sense that they're really looking very closely at all of their franchises like Marvel and Pixar and, yes, of course, Star Wars. So a lot of rumors flying around out there. I believe that Ryan Johnson, when he finally develops his pitch Whatever that's going to be, if the pitch gets accepted and gets the green light, I think it will show up as a streaming series. I think the rumored Boba Fett movie will show up as a streaming series. Or it might already be happening in the form of The Mandalorian. And speaking of The Mandalorian, just about everything, the whole future of Star Wars is pretty much locked up into the Mandalorian. That's going to be make or break. If that series isn't successful and popular and sells a lot of subscriptions to the streaming app, then I don't know what the future for Star Wars streaming is going to be. But you know what? From the outside looking in before it's even started, I think the future is very bright for the Disney Plus streaming service and Star Wars' place in there. So, Bill, if there's any one or two characters you'd like to see or situations you'd like to see being presented as a streaming service series on Disney Plus, what would be the top of your list? Oh, Kenobi is the top of my list. Kenobi is the top of my list, too. (laughs) Anything else? Uh, Probably fat. I don't know. I mean, there's there's so many. uh, See, Kenobi, to me, is is just so tied into the mythology because it seems like Ewan McGregor's on board. So there's, uh, there's already a lot of familiarity going in with it. You know, Boba Fett, I've always liked as a character. If they develop a series, who's going to play him? I mean, they get Daniel Logan in there. They bring back, um, um, Oh gosh, I'm, I'm spacing on his name. Tim Morrison. Played, yeah. Tim Morrison. Um, or do they go with somebody else entirely? I think I think the uh, appeal of that show would 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 totally hinge on that. Um, but I would love to see Boba Fett brought 
back doing some cool stuff that we'd always hoped to see. Um, now, some of that you might see in The Mandalorian. True. True. And Whatever we, might have been developed for the Boba Fett film that was supposed to be directed by Josh Trank until the plug got pulled on that one. Yeah. And 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 really, I mean, if you have a Mandalorian series, I, it's kind of hard to imagine that they would create a separate series with Boba Fett. I mean, that's a lot of Mandalorian right there. Yeah. You know. Right. So I, I that's a good point. So they maybe maybe they can incorporate him as uh, like uh, their best friends or something. Or maybe we, the Mandalorian. Know what era that is? Maybe the Mandalorian is Boba Fett. Yeah, true. True. It could be. Uh, and, and you know, based on the casting, it, it's, it doesn't seem uh, seem too far off the mark. But I don't know. I don't. I don't. I don't really want to see them go too too deep with uh, obscure characters. You know, I mean, like I've heard people say, Moss Eisley based series. I mean, you know, what, what is that like? Cheers. I mean, I I love <laughs> Moss Eisley, and I love. I mean, those of you who have listened to the show, you know that I love that cantina scene. You know, I absolutely adore it. But, I mean, you, you, a series has to be able to sustain itself. I mean, like, this at least through, you know, six or ten episodes, whatever they do now. I mean, right, it seems right, a lot right. of these things are limited. Run. What about, like, the sheriff of Moss Eisley? You know, that would be cool, where you, you deal with how Moss Eisley law enforcement works. And you, you base it, you know, in an era that happens before the imperial occupation. So well, the whole appeal of Moss Eisley is just the, the crazy creatures in there. Yeah, so if, if you're going to do somewhat of a, you know, a, a, an anthology type of thing with a sheriff, you, you'd probably have to deal. You know, one one week he's dealing with a hammerhead, one week he's dealing with a Greedo. I don't know. Could that be done? I'm not sure. Sure. Why not? Now, was there anything <laughs> from like modern era Star Wars that you'd like to see made into a series? We're already getting Cassian, but Cassian really is. Yeah. All of his things happen in the original trilogy era so like is there anything from sequel trilogy era you'd like to see from the sequel era yeah. like uh i'll see i was gonna i was gonna say saw Gerrera, but that's not sequel era what have you really brought me cargo pilot saw Gerrera talking doll of course debuted at toy fair last weekend every day more lies <laughs> What about a Han and Chewie? That's not sequel era either, but I no. mean. What about uh, yeah, signing up Harrison Ford and getting the adventures of Han and Chewie just prior to the events of The Force Awakens? Well, I would I would love to see what happened then, but yeah. they're not they're not going to uh, they're what not going to get Han, Harrison Ford to do that. Why wouldn't they? Everything. Listen, have you seen the things Harrison Ford's been signing up to do lately? Uh, Amazon commercials, and now he's like a talking dog in a cartoon. Scratch my belly. Yeah, I mean, come on. It's, <laughs> <laughs> Why wouldn't Is you that what he's that? reduced to scratch my belly? <laughs> oh yeah. Okay, you got me sold. That's gonna be a great series. Uh, Seeing on solo. Where's go. the newspaper, Chewy? Let's go play with the tennis ball in the backyard. <laughs> and then I'm gonna eat my own poop. <laughs> you big Let you me big furry oaf. Don't mind me, I just need to sniff you around uh this might be uh, this might be awkward, but I gotta do it. <laughs> what come on you can't sign him to to star if you're gonna get you and mcgregor i mean you get you and mcgregor i think harris would be like okay i'll yeah why not I'll fly that ship again well there is you know you and mcgregor there is some like film star power there oh, i mean yeah. it's true there's not as much of a stigma on on tv like there used to be between film and tv um and i was trying to think you and mcgregor um like, has he done any Netflix series and stuff? And wasn't wasn't he in Fargo? Didn't he do a season of Fargo? Yes, or something? he did. Yeah, yeah. So that that's pl that's very plausible. Sure. And and but but Ford, I don't I don't know, man. I just don't see him dipping his. Toe I've heard into that. Harrison say he just wants to work. So yeah. it sounds like if you got a big enough paycheck, he'll perform it. You know, read the lines in your script. Well, it would be great. I mean, the, you know, the, the one thing, the big thrill for me in seeing Force Awakens uh, w was sitting there and caught myself saying to myself a couple times, I am actually watching Han and Chewie on another adventure. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I would definitely like to see those 
gaps filled in somehow. Sure. Or you can even do a young Han and Chewie and sign up Alden. And uh, there may have been some solo two ideas banging around the hallways at Lucasfilm. You never know. I mean, yeah. just some ideas. You know, I'm sure John Kazan would be interested in jumping back into that fold. Yeah. No, I mean, that would that would be totally cool. I'd be like BJ and the Bear, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I'm going. You know, I'm going deep with that. You're, you, uh, right, but, Google BJ and the Bear. So, so sequel era show. The only sequel era show we really want to see is the Adventures of Old Han and Chewie. Chewie, we're old. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean seriously. What, what about? Uh, well, that was the original question. I'm still trying to what think about of Poe. Poe. Uh, yeah, Poe. Poe, maybe. Um, there could be adventures of... Uh, but nothing's really yeah. jumping out at me. I'm, tr- I'm, I'm trying to think. Sequel era. Now, see, with Poe, you can do a show <sighs> about him being a, a great galactic hero and pilot prior to the events of The Force Awakens. Do you think they'd want to take any of these streaming series and expand the story post-Episode 9? So the problem I, I have with doing that, and this is something that George Lucas very smartly was able to avoid, is that if you start mining that for material right away, then 10 years down the road, when you actually do want to make Episode 10, you're going to be handcuffed by these streaming series. So I don't know if they'd want to fill in the the space post Episode nine, but you know, it, I guess it just depends on what episode nine is going to be happening, what it's going to be all about, what how they're going to wrap up the 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 cinema, cinematic saga, and then it, can it somehow translate into a streaming series post post episode nine? Hearing myself say it, I'm like, boy, I don't want that. I don't want Star Wars then to just go out of the theaters and then. The story gets continued on TV. Yeah, it's like Twin Peaks or something. Yeah, I don't want that. I, Nothing see, wrong with Twin Peaks, by the way. Right, 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 right. But you got to save that stuff for the big screen. Yeah, I don't. I mean, you know, I got to tell you. I mean, I'm just. I'm having a hard time imagining it because it, it. It's like you said. I mean, everything does seem to be riding on the Mandalorian. It's hard for me to imagine just like regular Star Wars TV. I mean, we know what these cartoons could look like and what that feels like um but i gosh i don't know i mean phil it it just seems to me like my mind is so much tied into the idea of you know you fill in these gaps with the movie you know a a series is such a different animal because you have to it's 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 going to be a longer tale you know you have to you have to be able to sustain it over the course of you know, and and by the way, I'm not trying to dismiss it. It could be really cool because the fact that it might be over six or maybe even fifteen episodes. You know, say like a, a season of Better Call Saul. That's that's <laughs> right. about that's about fifteen episodes. I think is what they do twelve or twelve to fifteen. It's somewhere yeah. in that range. Um, you know, the good thing about that is that you can really kind of plot it along. So that's the, that's the benefit, as opposed to you know making a two hour movie where you're not really sure what the next one's going to be about, as we know has been uh, happening likely with the sequels, because you, you paint yourself in corners that way. So I mean, with a with a self contained series, I mean it could be really cool that way because they can mine it for a lot of drama that they know how it's going to play out. Um, you know, they could build those dynamics in a proper right, right, way. Right, right, right. So um, another idea that's always been bouncing around is uh, the idea of maybe a Red Squadron show, showing what guys like Wedge and Porkins and Biggs! <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, those guys, what they were up to prior to... The battle against the Death Star. Now we get a little taste of that, of course, in Rogue One, but I would love to have some sort of uh, a, a cool series about the uh, original Rogue Squadron, mm-hmm. Red Squadron. That would be, I think, kind of cool. Throw some Y wings in there. You got Gold Leader, and so I, I, you know, there's there's so many different directions they can go in. Yeah, um, I think that could be cool. Uh, the Mandalorian seems to be going down the right path. Uh, the Cassian series, everyone is sort of 
I've noted a lukewarm reaction to the Cassian series, mm-hmm. but if someone says, that, well, it's a Rogue One series, then you start thinking a little bit differently about it. You go, oh, well, if it's a Rogue One series, and we, we'll have K2SO in it, we'll have uh, Stormtroopers, obviously, and uh, maybe that guy he shot at the beginning of Rogue One. Oh, he's like, it's my arm! I can't <laughs> climb up there! That was cold. I got the arm! <laughs> They can open. That could be the. That could be the opener for every episode. Him, him shooting a he different a, guy that way. It's like Kenny dying all the time in South Park. Yeah. Right. This guy gets blasted in the back every week, and he's like, it like, could be a special guest star. You yeah, know, like, I sprained my ankle. I they can't d- go further. Do you remember that Blast. show? You remember the Naked Gun movies, right? It was. Yeah. Ba- it was based on. Remember the old TV show, Police Squad? A lot of people don't yeah. know that that was a TV show before First. it was Naked Gun. Yeah. And every week they had this gag. They do the opening titles this week on Police Squad. And, you know, it was very kind of uh, cheesy. And it would say special guest star, uh, Artie Johnson as himself. And he would die in the opening. <laughs> <laughs> it's like every week the guest, the special guest star would die. That could That's be, right. That could yeah. be, they could open the, the Cassian show that way with him blowing some dude away, you know. That's right, Mr. Poopy Pants. Frank Trebin. <laughs> so, yeah, you're right. That was a TV show before it was a movie. It was called... Um, before it was the Naked Gun. The Naked Gun, yeah. And from the files of Police from Squad. From the fly- Police Squad was the show. And uh, and so and then that was, of course, riding off the coattails of Airplane, one of the funniest movies of all time. <laughs> uh, you youngsters out there who weren't around in 1979, pop Airplane in sometime, and uh, you'll be on the floor laughing. So lots of streaming service series rumors flying around all over the place. It's just like anything anyone could fart out is being rumored as a streaming series. So uh, we'll have to wait and see. I, we're not going to get any big news about anything until April when the convention rolls into town. It's a McCormick place. And uh, I th- are you surprised? I can't believe, but that does seem the way they're going to go. Are you surprised by that? They're holding, it seems like they're holding everything back to April, right? Well, I mean, trailers. Yeah, because you know what? Gamut. That puts some real value into uh, the outrageously expensive ticket prices they're charging for the convention and uh, everyone coming out to it. I mean, they you want to be in that room when they make that yeah. announcement. Well, they, they did, did they do that for the other ones? I seem uh, to remember, no, no, like, no. episode... Wor- no. Wasn't the first no. glimpse of episode two we saw at Celebration 2? I think so. When McCallum I'm... had that little... <laughs> oh, that was so good. Rick McCallum's spe- that was the Rick McCallum yeah. spectacular, and he's up on stage. He's like smoking cigarettes. He's swearing at everyone. No, he wasn't. He, doing wasn't. That. he was doing that backstage, but uh, he was. You know, I mean, he's always real, a real straight shooter, Rick McCallum, uh, and a real. Um, from what I understand behind the scenes, he's a real, he's a real ball busting kind of guy, uh, and of course he is in that position. Being a Hollywood film producer, you have to make things happen, and you don't have time to suffer fools. And Rick McCallum is the type of guy who doesn't suffer fools, and so I really enjoyed just being around him when he was doing those shows. And the programming for Star Wars Celebration Two was so great because they. They had the panel happen like multiple times. I, I wish they would do that more for uh, these uh, conventions nowadays. Like mm-hmm. Rick would do his panel three times That's the whole right. weekend. Yeah. Even George Lucas did multiple panels for crying out well, loud. Well, he did. The interesting thing about George, and I, I don't want to get too far off track, but he he what he did was is is when he made his first appearance, which I think was Celebration Three, and um, people were camping out overnight to see him and from what i understand he was um he felt really guilty about that he didn't want people spending all their time waiting in line to see him Mm -hmm. so his future appearances at the conventions were surprises he would pop up and he he spread himself out pretty thin i mean he was popping up at a lot of different panel so yeah. everyone would get a chance to see him which i thought was really cool oh, it's um, easy to spread yourself thin when you got the helicopter <laughs> the, the engine still running up on the rooftop there it's, i don't care <laughs> I'm, I'm george <laughs> it's just, I'm, no we me and I'm swank george. me and swank saw him pull up with the the fleet of uh oh, did you yeah the fleet of of 
black SUVs with the, the nice. windows all tinted out and stuff, yeah. and you know, and big dudes you know, getting out of the car, clearing the area for Mister Lucas. You know, uh, George doesn't live his life day to day that way. He probably does take a bodyguard with him when he he's out and about in places like L.A. or wherever. But I think when he's just kicking around at home in the Bay Area, or I, I know for a fact when he's kicking around in his place here in downtown Chicago, that he just cruises out, walks the sidewalks just like anyone else, unaccompanied, and does really? you know just does his thing. Mm-hmm. Hey, look. Egg rolls, you know, pops in, get an egg roll, whatever. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm assuming George Lucas likes egg rolls. I'm sure he loves egg rolls. Yeah. So, I, 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 but I have no confirmation of that. But uh, the McCallum panel at Star Wars Celebration Two was so good. Did we see it more than once? Actually, I, I think we may have. I don't remember. It was just so good. Have. And Rick is such a straight shooter, and they showed so much footage from Episode 2. And yes. this was a month prior to it coming out. I, I was, remember. Was that our first glimpse, yes. though? That's the question. Uh, no, there were trailers, of course. They had trailers. They had okay. trailers, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so um, but it was our first stuff. glimpse at some specific footage, especially the Yoda dual footage. Well, at least everything leading up and to the remember duel. there was that montage that he showed that had the um, it didn't have any dialogue. It was just it was a montage with a like electronic score. I, I think it showed up on one of the DVDs. But it was just, it was very mm-hmm. rhythmic. Yeah. Do, 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 so on the episode was... two DVD, it was um, an ILM sizzle reel that kind of stripped down how they would develop these computerized special effects. It would like strip it down to a uh, total lack of, of detail, and then it would flesh out the detail. That was and... really exciting at the time. I wonder if that I got to dig that up and watch that again. Is it on the Blu-ray or was it just it, on the episode no, two? It's DVD? only on the episode two DVD. And yeah, Rick he showed that a couple of times during his panel. I just remember returning from Indianapolis and waking up in my own bed the week after, and like getting up a couple of mornings, going, "Wait, not wait. What, what's the date? Did I see episode two already? I mean, his." No, it hasn't been released yet, no. But, I mean, I had all of these great images and footage burned into my brain after the McCallum panel. So those were so good. So I really enjoyed those. Um, You know, we'll be lucky to get into one panel uh, (laughs) that's focused on the films. I mean, we'll be lucky to get in (laughs) because we're not standing in line. So Um, hopefully they do. It's yet to be announced about uh, how they're going to manage access to panels and manage lining up and things like that that's wow. yet to have been announced yeah they really hold off till the very end on this stuff and I, and I think they're tr- still trying to figure it out quite honestly but like i said no big news dropping it's still 20 years later still trying to figure it out well we were talking like how amazing it is that it seems like every time they do one of these conventions, it's it feels like it's the first time they've ever done it. But, of course, you know, staffs change in and out. You're dealing with different venues, different, different especially companies. in Chicago, you're dealing with the Teamsters here, too. So, <laughs> you know, you, you better True. have thick skin because those guys aren't going to put up with any garbage. Yeah, no, I mean, the logistics are massive. I know that. Yeah. But it just, it does. Uh, it's a lot better than, the, than it was in the old days when they had the 501st doing crowd control. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, that was that was a train wreck, let me tell you. That was an absolute train wreck. You need to have people who have actual experience in dealing with these kind of things. The five of first members, while it was cute, every stormtrooper you came up on was going, move along, move along. They were all saying that. Yeah. So everyone very... was just like doing circles in the Indiana Convention Center. It's like, <laughs> where are we? I, we had that imperial officer who kept telling us to, we had to move our seat at that one panel. And I said, if you tell us to move one more time, we're going to be out in the hallway. You know, we got there early. <laughs> And he kept telling us he was like he was so into the role. I mean, he was walking around with his hands behind his back, you know, like folded behind his back and stuff. And Mm -hmm. I tried to take a picture of him. He put his hand up, like blocking my camera. Yeah, he was uh, he was hardcore. This is a long time ago. (laughs) Hey, no knock on the five hundred first. We love what they do for charity and especially all the flavor they add to these events. And and the costuming is amazing. And we're always proud to be 
honorary oh, friends yeah. of the Legion. That's always been an honor yeah. of ours. So, uh, you know, we're not talking trash on a 501st, but no. it was just a terrible mistake to put them in charge of crowd control. And it, and <laughs> it commits so, like, with 33,000 so people. Like the hell, Hell's Angels at Altamont. Is it that <laughs> no, bad? No, no right. okay, all right. Bad. It's not, not that not bad. bad. Not um, that bad. But you, do you remember there was one year, and I, I forget which one it, it was, they had um, – the celebration store, which is always a, a total mob scene every year, but one year it was like wide open. It was wide open. I don't. I couldn't tell you exactly yeah. what they did, but they had plenty of merchandise. They had plenty of staff. They had plenty of registers, and you could go in there pretty much at any time. And there are people waiting around to help you. I mean, yeah. it was like, and I, and it was like it was almost over. It, they almost overcompensated. They overdid it. Mm-hmm. it. Just seems they can never find that balance. Two thousand seven at the L A. It was L A. Yes, Convention Center. Yeah, yep. and they had that a twenty four hour celebration store, mm-hmm. and. With your badge purchase, you were able to reserve shopping time at the store. And it was fantastic. Yeah, that's it was a perfect. good idea. Every celebration after that, they, they all just completely were were mind wiped and yeah. forgot how to do that. I, now, I think, of course, logically speaking, it's probably very complicated to get all of your ducks in a row to have that room in the convention center opened 24-7. Okay. Yeah. And then there probably was a lot of downtime where it wasn't worth it to have to pay to have that store open when no one was going in. No, I, I can't imagine that that approach was worth it. But, but there's got to be something in between. Least, extended hours at yeah. least. Yeah, or some kind of order system where you could go in and, and uh, there's uh, some economical way to staff it so people know when they can go to pick their stuff up. Mm-hmm. Something like that. So not 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 just an open retail type of situation where people are lining up, picking things off the shelf or t- trying to get there early to get things before they sold out. Stampeding. Yeah. Forget about it. For what? A plush wampa? Come on. <laughs> so no big news until Star Wars Celebration in April. That is my prediction. However, I do keep an opening available. <laughs> For a teaser trailer for Episode Nine with title release, I think there is still a distinct possibility we may see that before the convention and then see the first full trailer drop at the convention. But Smart Money tells me title reveal and teaser, teaser trailer mm-hmm. will drop at Star Wars Celebration. And they'll save the big trailer reveals for maybe a San Diego Comic Con. Oh, so you you think the title and the the first trailer will be at the convention together? Yes, at the same time. Yeah, if it doesn't happen prior to it, if it doesn't happen prior to it, um, the teaser and the title reveal, the title reveal for Revenge of the Sith. At a Steve Sansweet hosted panel at San Diego Comic Con back in two thousand four, that was the most mind blowing event of all time. They announce the title. Steve Sansweet walks out on stage wearing the Revenge of the Sith t-shirt. No one had ever mm. seen it before. What was this event? Yeah, I think it was San Diego Comic-Con. Comic-Con. Okay. 2004. Summer before the release of the film. And not only was Steve wearing the t-shirt, but you could go out and buy the t-shirt. They were now on sale right outside the convention uh, hallway, right out there in the convention hallway. And so, of course, there's Stampede. Everyone. Everyone. And, uh... <laughs> yeah, okay. All there was, my some, there was some great Foley there. Yeah, and all the action figures <laughs> fell over. <laughs> great Foley. Great Foley work. Here. Taking you back to the old days of radio. Stampede! <laughs> Gotta get hey. my exclusives! Get, get out of the way! Out of the way, Buster! I'm a grown man! I need a t-shirt! <laughs> what are you looking at, son? All right. So that's a public service announcement right there. Please behave yourself. It's Star Wars <laughs> celebration when it comes to exclusives. And don't be like running over children and old ladies to try to get a stupid t-shirt. But if you do make it there, can you get two? One for me? <laughs> Billy Mac needs one, too. Maybe maybe three. Get one for Swank also. Ow. Thanks. But we've been talking about the convention. We've been talking about some things we'd like to see happen there. And we've also been talking about everyone behaving themselves. But what we haven't talked about is RFR live in Chicago. 
It's happening. RFR Live in Chicago happening this April. We're going to be doing a live podcast event at a very well-known Chicago rock club, Reggie's 201 South State Street. It's about a mile away from McCormick Place. Tickets are on sale now. Visit rebelforceradio.com or reggieslive.com. Tickets will be $25 in advance, $30 at the door. We're going to go all night long. Doors open at 8, podcast begins at 9, and we're going to be there until they kick us out. We have the whole room to ourselves. Billy Mack is going to be there. Puppet Lando is going to be there. I'll be there. Chris Mocked is going to be there. Kevin Lyle is going to be there. We're going to have a table set up with merch from Norse Legion. And uh, so that might be a good opportunity for you to pick up things outside of the convention center. Also, uh, we are going to have music. This is going to be 21 and over. I'm sorry about that, but that is the rules of the venue. And we want to make it a party. We want you guys to uh, go up to the bar as often as possible. We're going to have a live mic set up in front of the stage so you can jump in on the show, on the conversation at any time. We'll be talking about all of our Star Wars Celebration adventures on Thursday, April 11th. Patreon members will be getting early bird access to tickets. And we believe that this event will sell out. So you're going to want to get your tickets right away if you want to see us on the real podcast stage. And that's going to be RFR Live in Chicago, Thursday, April 11th. On Saturday, April 13th, we are going to be having a Patreon-exclusive Saturday dinner show at a microbrewery about three and a half miles away from the convention center. Tickets are not ready to go on sale yet, and th- those that's going to be very limited. Those tickets will be limited. It's, uh, like I said, a, a more intimate evening with Rebel Force Radio, and you never know who else might show up. So those tickets will be made available only to members of the RFR Patreon community. So big bonus there. If you're part of RFR on Patreon, you're going to be getting first crack at Tickets for the big event, RFR Live in Chicago, happening Thursday, April 11th, following the first day of the convention. We are going to get together and party hard. Tickets $25 in advance, $30 at the door. And that is quite affordable compared to some of the other party ticket prices that I've seen going up to $100 and beyond. So uh, $25. What a value. And you'll be able to hang out with us all night long. So we're definitely going to be hanging out after we do our podcast as well. And we want it to be a Star Wars party that goes into the wee hours of the morning. And also, check out Rush Hour number 41, which is currently available. That's a Patreon-exclusive program that we produce. And RFR Rush Hour has more details. Be sure to follow us. RebelForceRadio.com, uh, follow our website, follow us on Twitter. That's right. You can follow the all-new RFR Twitter account. Can you believe it? We're back. We are back. Rebel Force Radio returns to Twitter with an all-new account. You can follow us at RFR Rebel Force. That's at RFR Rebel Force. Follow us to get show updates, announcements, videos, and more. And uh, also, you know, keep in mind, folks, I've been making a lot of noise about this, but there are RFR imposters running Mm -hmm. wild on Twitter, and we are looking to shut them down. So please avoid and report anyone on Twitter using the Rebel Force radio name. Only accept tweets from at RFR Rebel Force as legitimate Rebel Force radio updates. And uh, so, yeah, everyone be cool out there on Twitter. It's crazy times, crazy times with the social medium. But um, you can now follow us on Twitter. And, of course, we always are there on Facebook as well. All right, Billy Mac, with no Jason Swank in the house, I thought it would be a great idea to devote the rest of this show to our amazing audience of Star Wars fans, the greatest Star Wars fans in the galaxy and open up the voicemail hotline. Yeah, cool. And see what everyone has to say. So uh, let's get into it. 
You must contact me. Play back the entire message. What message? Message after the message. The Emperor commands you to make contact with him. It's a trick. Send no reply. Jimmy and Jason, it's Bo from St. Louis. Long time caller, first time listener. Oh, what? No, flip that. No. No, I uh, spoke to you through a third party uh, the day after the last Jedi opened. Our mutual friend Rich was on site with you all, and uh, I was on the phone with him just to get his reaction. And he was kind of sharing my reaction with you all. And yeah, I was I was kind of kind of in a, in a weird mood after seeing the last Jedi. I've since warmed up to it, but I, I did share with you that. You know, at least the day after, I was thinking there's so much Star Wars content out there that, you know, I could, I could uh, possibly just write this movie off as one that I didn't care so much for, just like some of the Clone Wars episodes and Rebels episodes were just kind of filler to me. So, again, I, I've warmed up to The Last Jedi since then quite a bit. Uh, I do think one one opportunity they missed is, uh, and I was kind of hoping for it pulling for it is after the uh, Ray and Kylo fight with the guards and after uh, Snoke was killed to hear the Emperor's laugh in the background oh. and the good good that would I that would have saved it for me I think and I I still have a feeling we're, we haven't seen the last of the Emperor so we'll we'll have to see once uh, episode 9 comes out but Maybe that's going to be the big uh, twist at the end, is, or at least uh, midway through, is that the Emperor is still in control of everything. Don't know how. Don't really care how, you know, but uh, I think that would be uh, that would be a real stunner for me, and I, I would look forward to seeing that. As far as the title goes, yeah, I think I uh, even tweeted out balance, just the one word balance was going to be my guess, and that was, uh, you know, months ago, so... I, I put that on record just in case. I know that there's some talk about balance being in the in the title somewhere. So, but I have a good feeling that uh, you know that word would sum up the saga quite a bit, and hopefully we'll see some form of that whenever they make their announcement. Looking forward to celebration, Chicago, Jimmy. Don't know if you'll have time, but perhaps a little jaunt off to the Galloping Ghost would be in order. I would so much look forward to that. But uh, I'll be coming up by train from St. Louis. I'm looking forward to that. I haven't haven't ridden the, the train to Chicago, so that'll be a journey, you know, on itself. So looking forward to it, guys, to uh, seeing you all again. And, of course, any any uh, RFR party that, that's in the works, I'll mm. certainly plan on being there. Awesome. Thank you all. Just hoping to get your uh, thoughts on the possibility of the Emperor's return. Bo from yeah. St. Louis. See ya, buddy. Thanks for a great email, Bo. I really appreciate it. What, what I really appreciate from Bo, and I knew he was a Midwesterner, because he knows how to pronounce Chicago. We were discussing Chicago. this the other night, yeah. Not Chicago. Chicago, Chicago. Yeah, You got it. Chicago. You got to hit that A. So uh, we'll, we'll know if, if you're from out of town, and we know I, a lot of you will be, if you want to yeah. fit in. Chicago. Well, there are a lot of locals that seem to think that you, that it's supposed to be said Chicago. Chicago. Like a caw bird. But yes. I've never heard, I don't hear people using it. I've never grown up with that pronunciation. It's Chicago, people. I mean, come on. <laughs> Let's see. You, you got to, you got to, you know. got to hit it. You, you got to hit, hit those hard. A's right, you know. got to hit hard, just like we hit everything hard. Um, the Emperor returning in Episode 9. I think... It is essential for the Emperor to make his presence known at the end of this film. His, he is the Phantom Menace, ladies and gentlemen. So if you've been wondering where he's been hiding out or, you know, how come we haven't seen him, it's because that's what Palpatine excels at is twisting perspective and manipulating from behind the scenes. He's the ultimate puppet master. We didn't see him in the flesh until Return of the Jedi when he finally did make his his presence uh, known physically. But I think to wrap it all up, you have to have Palpatine being revealed as, you know, the Wizard of Oz, the man behind the curtain. It has to be Palps. What do you hmm. think, Bill? Uh, well, I, I don't agree. I, I think that'd be a weird way to conclude no. the trilogy. No, because I mean, what, like, you he, think like, like, haha, I'm he, in charge. Dude, he is the one. The end? His, 
he is responsible for kicking off the entire series of events. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, I, I, I get that. I understand that point. That's not lost on me. I'm talking but, about but, the galactic conflict. But I'm not talking he, about he, exploration in the Force or the Chosen One or balance of the Force or any of that stuff. Yeah. I'm talking no, I know about what you mean, the mechanics the, the, of yes, the... Yes, the actual events that happen in the Star Wars mm-hmm. saga are all orchestrated by Palpatine up until the end of... Return of the Jedi. It would be so perfect if he revealed himself once again. How does he... I mean, how can you assume he didn't get off the Death Star? I mean, I mean you know, Jedi... You how can I down assume? The, <laughs> well, the Death Star, well, yeah, he went down the shaft and the Death Star got blown up. Yeah, but what if right when he got to the bottom of the shaft, he I used he'd the force to, to cushion his fall? Because we've seen Jedi do that. He cushions his fall. And he lands just right. And, and then he, Force there, pushed his way through space. Maybe there was Princess a shuttle Leia. there. Maybe there was a shuttle there. And, and Thanks for picking me up. <laughs> and, and a lot of his Sith artifacts were left on board the Death Star, too. So he lost his powers. Like, he was stripped of his powers because he was using talismans. And We've heard oh, about this story about some like kind it. of MacGuffin in Episode Nine that could be something that might make the Emperor reveal himself. Mm-hmm. There's that rumor going out. Yeah, there I have heard the rumor about the MacGuffin, yeah. but um, I don't know. It just it just seems to. Well, okay. the The mandate of this whole tr- new trilogy has been to build a new saga, um, not necessarily independent from the original although you know based on the last jedi it, do, it, do, it did really i think you know that was some of the strong reaction was because it did seem like it was trying to uh shut the door on the on the uh the the original trilogy um and i i, I do think that fans want that 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 texture still woven into the story somehow skywalkers and all that stuff but it just seems like too much of a backtrack to bring the emperor back i i i mean i do agree with you there's a big there is a big problem with the story about how the first order just arose i mean do do these empire uh, type of regimes always pop up when when there's a a, a, you know (laughs) When when one goes like down, it. another one comes up. I mean, it just, you know, they 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 never really explained how that took place. Right, so yeah. uh, bringing back the emperor, of course, would start to fill in some of those gaps. Right, but- and those are wide open gaps, which can be filled in any way possible. They they're not handcuffed because they've explained too much already. You know, yeah. if if, if they're clever, killed- they can they can find ways to make it all tie together. Right, and they killed Snoke, who people said was an imitation of the Emperor anyway, as a character that he was drawn, you know, from kind of the same cloth. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of that was another criticism. So, of course, you know, if it was actually the Emperor still pulling the strings, then you you couldn't really say that anymore, I guess. Um, Scud and the fall. I don't know. It just seems like such. I mean, to to end the trilogy. I mean, you're saying to end it like with the reveal and then it's over. No, it just seems no, a weird way to. No, not to wrap it up. I mean, like that's not the victory. Like Ewoks aren't going to start dancing around a fire when, well, they'd have when to the do... Emperor comes walking out. But I mean... see, they, they they create a lot of story burden uh, by reintroducing him. So it would have to be. I mean, somewhere midway through. I mean, because if you're if you're if you reintroduce him, you've got to. Resolve his story now. Sometimes because I it's, fear that I filmmakers mean, will just say, "Well, we'll just explain it in a comic book." You know, I, I don't. We don't. I never. Yeah, you know, I don't like tight. that approach. No. And, and that was one thing that I always worried about with Solo, with Darth Maul coming back. Although that's totally in limbo. But the 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 idea was is that okay? Obviously, he survived Phantom Menace, getting chopped in half. How did that happen? Well, if they were going to continue that filmatically, is that a word? Film film filmatically filmatically. That they, would be the, that, would that should be to... the name of your podcast <laughs> when you launch it, and it's talking about all the movies. Okay. because you're a movie maniac. Yeah, you'll call it filmatically. With film Billy maniac. Mac. Yeah. Film with Ma- Billy Mac, the film maniac. <laughs> okay. I, oh, right. Hey, I think you're getting something there. But uh, I, that was that was always 
you know, my thing about that was was that okay, so th- they bring Maul back. They're gonna they're gonna have him. Uh, they're gonna delve in his s- story again. They're gonna have to s- explain in some simple way in the films how that happened, how he came back. And you know, people could easily say to me, "Well, it happened in the cartoon. You know, you watch the cartoon, and that's how you know." But the films can, I don't think, can ever assume right. that the uh, the film audience is going to know stuff from comic right. books and cartoons. That's a danger, actually. Yeah. So that's a big, that's it, a big, it's a burden, fall, you know, yes. I mean, a, a pothole to fall into, you know? Yeah, you cannot rely on that. It just, it, it needs to be self-contained somewhat in that sense, that the films explain themselves and can stand on their own. Now, I'm, I'm not saying the cartoons and the comics can't supplement that and, and, you know your your enjoyment of it or or whatever, um, but that's all it should do is supplement. Supplement, yeah. It shouldn't it just guide the, the direction of the cinematic yeah. Star Wars universe ever. And the film should be the other way around be, a lot. Quite, yeah, you know, quite honestly, the films should be informing the animated series, not the other way around. Right. I yeah. I think that. Now I I don't. I, if they did decide to use some of those story elements, I would be fine with that. But it, it, it would have to be addressed somehow. I mean, it, it wouldn't even have to be anything complicated, just a, a scene or something where you, you know, so so you're not obligated to have to do this uh, homework before going to see these movies. Because yeah. not everybody is going to, you know, not everybody's a con- I don't I don't read the comics much, if at all. I'll, I read an issue here or there. I read them religiously, but I count on the cinematic Star Wars universe to provide the big detail. I, I, you know, the comics, they should be their own universe, you know, and craft characters and situations that play off right. of the film. So don't you think bringing back the Emperor would create a similar situation as uh, Solo had with oh, Darth Maul? That's uh, really kind of what I'm would it, saying. Yeah. Yeah, but see, I think... I think they had their eyes on a solo sequel where that would be explained more or a Crimson. Oh, I think so. Yeah. Crimson Dawn. I think the Crimson Dawn would have been something that could have been a storyline that would run through all of the standalone films. Mm -hmm. So you'd have the Crimson Dawn being a presence in solo. Then if you do the Kenobi standalone film, the Crimson Dawn is a presence in that. And Darth Maul's story gets further explained. And then you have maybe a Boba Fett movie. Crimson Dawn once again. Okay. With Darth Maul, a steady antagonist throughout. And then it all comes together. All the characters come together in a Crimson Dawn film that makes brings the whole story together right and and i could see that and i think that that was probably the attempt uh in bringing that character back in solo but solo was the potential beginning of something whereas this next star wars movie is the conclusion of a trilogy so Uh, not not only a conclusion of a trilogy a conclusion of the Skywalker saga. That's how they're marketing. That's how they're it. framing it. Yeah. 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 So you bring the Emperor back. How do you how do you take care of all that? Hey, listen in one movie. That's outside my pay grade, okay? <laughs> um give me a weekend and maybe a bottle of tequila Mull it over. and I'll come over with a okay. real good idea. Okay. But Here's... that that's my reaction to the Emperor. All right. Idea. Let's get back into these uh voicemail messages on the oh, RFR. Do you want to say anything about his his title suggestion? Balance, the one one word title? Just balance. Yeah, I think that's what both. Well, I would like balance of the force. Quite honestly, Mm -hmm. that was a title that I always wanted to. uh, It was being floated out there as a potential title for episode one. And when George announced the Phantom Menace, I was like, balance of the force sounds more Star Warsy. Balance of the force sounds awesome. Oh, was that something he actually considered at one time? We don't know. Ah, you know that that was just a rumor. That was a rumor. And then uh, the working title for episode one was The Beginning. So obviously, you know, you needed to kind of spice that up a little yeah. bit. Um, and he did with The Phantom Menace, which is really kind of a, a name that's kind of totally grown on me over the years. Um, here we are celebrating the 20th anniversary of The Phantom <sighs> Menace this year. It? That's yeah. crazy. There's going to be a panel in Chicago on the Monday. 
<laughs> and that's the first panel they've announced because apparently those Monday tickets aren't selling so well. Still can't figure out the rationale be- behind having a Monday. Mm-hmm. Maybe um, they-, they must have sweetened the deal with um, McCormick Place and the Teamsters and all them. You know, oh, you can have it, but you have to use it on Monday, too. Oh! <laughs> hey, that's how things go on behind closed doors here in Chicago. All right, here's Todd from Columbus. Hey guys, this is Todd from Columbus. I wanted to call and ask if there was any news on uh, what you guys had talked about a few months ago, a uh, meetup, a RFR meetup at um, Rancho Obi-Wan. And um, I was going to make a suggestion. It'd be a good thing for a non-celebration year uh, since uh, a lot of people are going to be traveling in a few months. uh, You know, give us a break and... uh, do a meet up a little later, uh, maybe in uh, 2020. Um, keep up the work, good work. Thanks for all you do, and uh, we'll talk to you later. Bye. All right. Well, obviously, Todd, thank you so much for calling. Um, an RFR meetup at Rancho Obi Wan has been on my bucket list for a long, long time. I have a great relationship with the guys over there. They're honestly some of the best people I know, and I'm honored to call them all friends of mine. Uh, we have not discussed the logistics about something like this. Obviously, all of their creative energies and all of their energy is going towards making Star Wars Celebration in Chicago a great event. They're going to have an amazing setup at McCormick Place. Let me pull up the information on that because I, I need to uh, refresh but, myself. But Todd should have faith. I, I've been di- I have never been to Rancho Obi Wan. I've never been to San Francisco. I've been dying to go. So something like that would be long overdue. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, and it's you know it's I make yearly trips out to Rancho Obi Wan to visit those guys. Uh, like I said, they're some of the best friends I have, and. Um, we have talked about it a little bit. Maybe we'll talk a little more seriously about it when the gang rolls into town for uh, the event in April. What do they have going on there? 20-year retrospective. This is happening. Check this out. I'm looking at RanchoObiWan.org right now, and they have their description for what's going on for the Rancho Obi-Wan experience at Star Wars Celebration Chicago. You will be greeted by a 20-year retrospective on Star Wars Celebration, the first of which was in Denver in May 1919. 1999. No, no, no. (laughs) 1999. And developed by our own Steve Sansweet. Twelve conventions later, Steve did. A lot of people may not recognize that fact, but the brain trust behind the original Star Wars Celebration, which happened... In conjunction with the release of Episode One 20 years ago, it, it, I think Celebration was two weeks before the film opened. Um, maybe it was even as far as a month um, before the film opened. Star Wars Celebration in Denver. And that was developed by the brain trust of Steve Sansweet, Anthony Daniels. Remember him? Oh, yeah. What's he do again? What does he do? Oh, 3PO. Uh, uh, oh, my. <laughs> I thought you were just instantly going to go, he's 3PO. <laughs> and, of course, th- of course, longtime Rebel Force Radio friend Dan Madsen, friend of the show Dan Madsen, who is the guy who spearheaded the whole thing uh, with, you know, assistance, uh, big assistance from Steve Sansui and Anthony Daniels. Dan, of course, was the president of the Star Wars fan club and uh, publisher of Star Wars Insider Magazine, and this is something he always wanted to make happen. Why can't Star Wars fans have cool conventions to go to, like those Trekkies are always lording over us? (laughs) That was always the thing. Why can't we have what Star Trek fans have? Well, Dan Madsen, being a big fan of both the two biggest star franchises... Wars and Trek, he decided, hey, I'm going to take what I know from Trek and apply it to the wars and give fans a great opportunity to get together, uh, be exposed to the creators and and cast and crew of Star Wars films and just have a good old fashioned Star Wars time. So, wow, we're 12 conventions later and it's still going on pretty strong. So that's going to be happening at the Rancho Obi-Wan Experience at Star Wars Celebration Chicago, an incredible retrospective of all 
20 years of Star Wars celebration. Um, uh, probably everything from rare exclusives to unique photos you've never seen before, and uh, maybe even some of that mud from Denver where it didn't stop raining and much of the convention was held outside. <laughs> Intense and stuff. What a nightmare. And it just rained nonstop. But you know what? Star Wars fans didn't care because at that time it was the first unique event for Star Wars fans to come together and celebrate the saga. And just prior to episode one hitting theaters. And I remember that very same weekend was the first Midnight Madness for Star Wars episode one action figures and memorabilia it was just a i mean what a great time i just really get warm and fuzzy thinking back to those those days yeah, yeah. It really were it's hard to believe 20 years and and 22 years since the special editions mm -hmm. and 20 years before that was the first star wars movie <laughs> I, I don't know why that's significant but i'm just trying to connect it somehow the star wars family tree right there but you know it, well it's just i don't know I, I think about these things sometimes you know when it's like it's it seems like it was just yesterday i was going to see those special editions in the theater and that was over 20 years ago at the time i was seeing those the original movies seem like really ancient history to me you know because I was a little kid when yeah. those came out. Right. I was I was I was an adult. I was in my twenties when the when the special editions came out, and it was a whole new era. But what I think made the and now time, that that's twenty years ago. So. What I think made the time drag so much is that there was no Star Wars filling the void. I mean, there was nothing there. There was no comics, no merchandise, no animated series. You know. It was just nothing no. there. I mean, okay, if people want to point at the Droids and Ewok series that ran from <laughs> 84 and 85, I mean, you can, I guess. But, um, you know, any any kid who actually grew up with the original trilogy by that time had pretty much outgrown silly, kitty Saturday morning cartoons. That's a fact of life. I'm telling you yeah. firsthand. You well, know, if, well, if you're a collector, you had it in your closet. You'd revisit right, it every right. once in a while. You'd put on the, the video tapes of the movies occasionally. And I've, I've mentioned this before. I had no notions that it was ever going to come back. I remember the first time you told me that Hasbro was making new figures or Kenner yes. was making new figures. The steroid that, was, that was my first inkling that it was coming back in any way. I was very surprised at that. For me, I knew the door was opening, obviously with Timothy Zahn's Heir to the Empire. That was the big return of Star Wars. And uh, from then, it just kept snowballing. And when Zahn's book became a New York Times bestseller, I think everyone kind of crapped their pants a little bit and realized that we have an audience out there who is starving for content. Let's get the ball rolling. Soon Star Wars comics started to kick in. Uh, the expanded universe grew to amazing heights and it just herald the return of star Wars with the special edition. And then finally the, the prequel trilogy. So, Oh man, memories 20 years ago, 20 years ago. Hey Jimmy. Hey Jason. It's JR from Cleveland. Just finished up the latest episode when you guys were talking about some theories with Chris from Cleveland as well. Um, that just brought up some thoughts. You know, when I thought of the the way I always read the the Kylo and Ray scene, uh, I always thought of it as you know Kylo just saying what Ray's deepest, darkest fears were, not that he actually knew what her parents or who her parents are. I think Ray was so young when she was left; she never really, she probably doesn't remember who her parents are or how they acted or anything about them. It all just kind of faded away as she got older. So that's what she always feared. Like we see in the mirror cave, she just sees herself because she can't see her parents. She's always afraid of being alone. And since they have this force connection, Kylo knows this. He And he just happens to say it out loud to her face. So I don't think he knows the truth one way or the other. He just knows what she thinks. And uh, that also brought up some other thoughts. I remember an old theory I had way before The Last Jedi came out about, you know, Kylo and uh, or Ben and Ray 
being brother and sister is that it was actually Ben who left Ray on Jakku when everything went down at Luke's, you know, Jedi Academy. Ben couldn't bring himself to actually, she was there really young and Ben couldn't bring himself to kill his own sister. We've kind of seen that before with Leia. So he, while everything's going on with the other students, he hides her, he brings her to Deku and just drops her off and leaves her there. Now, and maybe that's why he was so angry about a, a girl on Jakku in that one scene in TFA. And, and don't forget that that helmet that Ray puts on, the name in Arabesh on the side is Ray. So that might not actually be her real name. It does, Ray might just be the name that she gave herself. Um, so that might be another reason why Kylo doesn't react to the name Ray. But other than that, also just thinking about a clone of Palpatine, wouldn't it just be a clone in body and, you know, looks only? I mean, wouldn't it have to be, does that mean the, the clone of Palpatine was... Oh, no, dude. Oh, we lost him. Son of a... Um, Leave us hanging. He was going to say what, uh, what the clone of Palpatine is. A, a lot of times they'll, they'll call back and they'll finish their oh. thought. Let's see if he did that. I'm not seeing it. Uh, wow. Um, well, okay. I mean, just real quick, we, we talked a little bit about Palpatine. So um, uh, he's, he's saying Palpatine could be a clone. I've always considered the possibility Snoke is a clone of Palpatine's. Um, it's 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 possible. It's possible. It's possible. You know? But what is that? What does a clone mean? I mean, you you create the same person who has the same mind and memories. Well, what the I mean, way have they we seen it, that? The way they did it in the Dark Empire comics, when they had the uh, clone of Palpatine, was that he was essentially transferring his his essence into these clone bodies he had stashed away in a secret hideout they were in like these these containers filled with liquid you know <laughs> <laughs> and so he would like he would like bounce from body to body the thing is though is that the dark side of the force would corrupt the muscles and skeleton and flesh of the, the 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 physical body that he'd be inhabiting, it would just like it would make it look like eventually like old Palpatine did at the end of Return of the Jedi in a real short period of time. So he kept having to move from body to body, and when he would get a young, fresh body, he'd be ready to brawl. But again, the dark side would corrupt the physicality of that clone body yeah. and he would just shrivel away again. The, the, and apparently this is something Palps has been doing forever, yeah. you know? I, there's, yeah, that's kind of a thing that has shown up in like the Twilight Zone and stuff like yeah. that. Where people, ha they, in order to be immortal, they have to, you know, find another body, they have to kill in order to create some elixir that keeps them going for another, <laughs> you know, hundred years and they have to do it over again. See, I think, huh. I, I think it's going to be revealed that if Palpatine does return in episode nine, there are these like Sith artifacts but, that but, he has collected that give him the power to transfer his essence or his soul yeah. or whatever, however you want to look. Well, that's kind of Harry Potter-esque. That's kind of the Voldemort Horcrux, uh, idea it, it also is something that was kind of played around with in the darth vader comic line from marvel where you had the sith lord from the past the recent one yes oh yeah you guys were talking about this he had a helmet right that was uh, something that was kind of a conduit that could bring him back to life and of course he required darth vader to do a, a series of dark side sorcery to bring him back on the planet Mustafar. What was that guy's name, too? It was Lord Momin. Lord Momin. And uh, so, I mean, this is kind of something that's being established a little bit. Um, could it be something that's for us hardcore fans who read the comics, read the books, and see the movies 500 times, is this something that's being laid out for the hardcore fan to then 
except if Palpatine does return. Well, of course, a precedence had been set in the Darth Vader comic and in the Dark Empire comic and, you know, throughout the history of Star Wars storytelling, the Emperor's resurrection could have some basis in those old stories, specifically the functionality behind his return. Like, how did it happen? Well, you know, he... This crazy guy's got a collection of clone bodies that he bounces off of. You know, he's like one week and he's this guy, one week and he's that guy. I don't know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, but so but always uh, always the same old palps. All right, so that's Palpatine. So we've talked about that twice right now. What we were also talking about before his his call got cut off, um, he did talk a lot about Ray and. Um, Way Kylo read her mind and broke the story to her about her parents. And something that occurred to me when I was listening to Jerry from Cleveland is that, like, I obsess over the fact that they were nobody. They're nobody. They're, they're, you're nothing. You're nobody. They're nobody. I have focused so much on the fact that Kylo is telling Ray her parents were alcoholic losers who sold her for drinking money. I have focused on that so much. I've never really considered the the impact of Kylo's other reveal about Ray's parents, that they're dead in a pauper's grave. Mm. You know, I mean, like, Ray is being told her parents are dead. She wants to reunite with her family. Over and over again, Ryan Johnson has said, well, I just had to make sure the characters all heard the worst news possible because it you know puts their back up against the wall and presents the greatest challenge. And I always thought I focused so hard on the fact that Ray's parents were losers, that she doesn't come from some sort of grandiose lineage, you know? I focused so hard on that, I totally forgot about the fact that she had just received confirmation that the family she's seeking to reunite with no longer exists. They're dead. You know? I never really took that into account. And so, yes, that is the worst thing, the worst possible situation to put these characters in. That's dev- That has to be devastating to Ray. Well, because she, well, c- c- she uh, obviously didn't know, right? I mean, she was waiting she for them to come to back. She was looking to reunite with them, she said, yeah. many times. Now, many times she was waiting for her family. She even wanted to return to Jakku after leaving it, after leaving that, that junkyard, merely because she wanted to be reunited with her family. For some reason, I was focusing so much on the fact that Ray was disappointed because she's learning that she's nobody, her parents were nobody, and they were losers on top of that, deviant losers. And so I thought, like, that has the worst impact on Ray. No, that's not the worst thing. The worst thing is she found out her family is gone, her parents are dead. Why didn't I ever make that connection? I mean, really, I'm telling you guys, everyone listening to the show, you are hearing me have a revelation uh, about something that I've been complaining about a little bit, because I heard Ryan many times say that he wanted to present the worst possible scenario to the characters in order to create the greatest challenges for them. Mm-hmm. And I thought the worst possible scenario he was creating for Ray was the knowledge that her parents aren't somebody special. It's not Han. It's not Luke. It, they're mm-hmm. just loser they're nobodies not, who yeah. drank too much and actually did the unthinkable of selling their daughter, their five-year-old daughter, for booze money. I mean, that is the lowest of the low. That is is the worst. I mean, so. Didn't even sell her to good parents. They <laughs> Yeah, it's, I mean, it's bad enough to sell your kid, but to not even put him in a good home to well, sell him I mean, into who's buying children <laughs> these days. Guys like hunk our plot. Scary I, to think. of. Well, but so like I, I, I just obsessed and focused so hard on that being the worst scenario for Ray is that her parents are nobody's. No, the worst scenario for her is her parents are dead. She has no family. There's nothing. There's right. no reunion for Ray. You know, oh, you know that that. Uh, thank you, Jerry from Cleveland. Can I say a few things about this because I I just I, it's a complex story element, and I, I hear a lot of people saying that it's going to be revealed to us that that Kylo actually lied to her, or that it's somehow basically going to be 
that, that something a different reality about her parents is going to be revealed. Having them be nobodies and having them dead, though, does not necessarily um, rule out the possibility that there is lineage because we still don't really know who they were. Um, you know, they could they could have come from a powerful lineage and simply failed as human beings. That's possible. I but I you know I always thought the purpose of that, and I've thought about this a lot because there's so much disappointment in it. Um, which, which I understand fully, but it does, it does do that somewhat classic Star Wars thing, which is it disengages her, it disengages her as a main character from this fantasy she has of reuniting with her parents and I guess resuming some or starting some kind of normal, wholesome life with them. I'm not sure what she really has in mind, but that removes that element from her existence and there's this idea I, I felt, you know, the whole mirror sequence is that she's, you know, she wants to see her parents and she ends up seeing herself it was not so much that she has all the answers or anything, but, but basically the message is don't define yourself by who your parents are. You know, don't let that limit who you are. That's what I thought they were trying to say with that. Maybe not. Um, you know, I, 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 but I do think that that the way it was presented to us was the intent. Now, whether that will be changed in the next movie, I mean, look, they they could write anything around this, but I just I know that from Force Awakens on, Daisy Ridley has been saying in the press, and she said it many times that she knew who her parents were, who Ray's parents were. She said it numerous times. I just quickly Googled a thing, and up came something from Yahoo Japan. <laughs> <laughs> I, it sounds like a credible source, but here's a quote. Well, uh, no, of course it's a credible yeah, source. Yeah, it's a credible but, source. Th- th- what I'm wondering she, is how credible your translation of Japanese is going to be here. So let's just <laughs> Well, I'll do in. my best. Uh, she says, whatever the answer, I just hope that the moment everyone... And she's talking... This is uh, press for Last Jedi. So she's specifically talking about Last, uh, Last Jedi. Whatever the answer, I just hope that the moment everyone finds out is an enjoyable experience for viewers. And though I have known the answer for several years now, the series that Ryan Johnson created has turned out to be spectacular beyond even my imagination. To be honest, I was very moved. I think it will be a moving moment for everyone else as well. That is when we find out who her parents were. And that is the scene with Kylo Ren. So, um you know, I, I think that that was what they wanted. Now, what message that sends, I, I don't know. We, we've talked about that a lot. But I, I, I think there's an important message there about, you know, disengaging from um, this reality that you're, you're born with that might be limiting. Um, you know, it's a good message. I, I don't know how good it is within the framework of the story. Um, I'm willing to let it play out to see. Um, and I, I get why people have criticized it. Um, amongst other things, but um, I, I I do think it was intended as it was uh, as, as it was given to us. I really do. What so that well, her that, parents are nobodies. Well, here's the thing. Here's the thing. J.J. Abrams shot a vastly different movie with the Force Awakens originally before it went into the editing suite. It got chopped up. There was reveals removed from that film, well, specifically Ray's lineage, Knights of Ren. Okay, okay, but she has. How did Maz get she, the lightsaber? Now, that was all in the film before it was released, I, I, and they edited. It, and also, they stripped Luke of his okay. Jedi powers because he was supposed to have boulders floating out around him when he was standing there meditating, looking out over onto the yeah. onto the ocean, and uh, when Ray walked up on him. Yeah, no, I, I I generally agree with that, but on this particular point, I got to say, so do you think that when because it seems to me that when Force Awakens was coming out and Daisy Ridley was doing press, she was saying a, a very similar thing that she knows what the answer is about her parents. So it, Last Jedi comes out and here she's saying the same thing. Yes, I know. I've known for several years. Are are you saying that 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 answer changed? From J.J. to no, Ryan? No, um, no. No. On retrospect, I don't think so because... So then J.J. did have the that thing. in mind. Here's, here's, what, here's why I think... I think J.J. left it wide open for Ryan. 
And Ryan did what Ryan did with the handoff from J.J. When it comes down to J.J. returning for episode nine, he's looking closely at the material he removed from The Force Awakens, specifically material with Carrie Fisher in it. And he is going to be crafting the story around that material that he had already shot and intended to put in The Force Awakens, but J.J. decided to open up his mystery box. So when they got into the editing suite, took out huge chunks of stuff that revealed great exposition having to do with the sequel trilogy, specifically all of the crazy crap we've been debating and yelling and screaming and questioning and wondering and hypothesizing and speculating. All that stuff is a lot of stuff that should have been revealed to us in episode seven. Who's Snoke? Who's Ray? Who are Ray's parents? Why is Luke on Act 2? Why is R2 under a tarp? Okay, but we were given a reveal of who's Ray's, Ray, Ray's parents were. Well, that, was, at least might, in that part. might change things. That might have changed things. But, so you, but do you not think that that's what J.J. had in mind then? If he had the answer already. I think he's back going then. to do whatever it takes to Do you think Ryan resolve changed it? I think Ryan may have. I do, because Ryan, like I said, they wanted to have Luke with the floating boulders, meditating deep in the force, tapping into the force when Ray approaches him in, at the end of The Force Awakens and holds out that lightsaber. Mm-hmm. There were supposed to be CGI boulders floating there. Mark Hamill himself has confirmed this. Go tweet at him. He'll probably tweet it back at you. Yeah! I thought they were boulders. <laughs> but <laughs> that didn't end up in the final cut. So why is that? Because Ryan had a script that he had prepared and finished prior to the release of The Force Awakens. And Kathleen Kennedy and everyone, all the executives at Lucasfilm, were enamored with the script. And so they had J.J. make appropriate changes to the final okay. edit of so you think the JJ Force tailored Force Awakens? Yes, yes. I, and I can so, I, I, I can name two so examples as to not interfere with Ryan Johnson's future reveals. I think that he was requested to, and he did. He removed the CGI boulders, and he also replaced BB-8, who was supposed to make the trip to Octu in the Falcon with Chewie and Ray. That was supposed to be BB-8 with them. But Ryan requested R2. Mm-hmm. So that change was made. Those are two changes I know of for sure. Yeah. But that but that's not an essential mystery, though. The, the mystery about Ray's parents was set up in Force Awakens. I'm just wondering, is the answer that we got different from what J.J. originally had in mind? Because we've got press of Daisy Ridley saying she's known the answer. She knew it back then, and she knew it. Going into Last Jedi. So that, well, I mean, if we take all this evidence she's together, known, yeah. whatever we learn in episode nine, we'll be able to then review everything with episode well, eight. I, I, well, yes, it's, the, all, it's all speculative, through the I guess, lens until of we see hindsight, the, the, you know, the I mean, resolution. Yeah. But Through the lens of hindsight, mm-hmm. we'll be able to say, oh, that's where Ryan may or may not have subverted jj's original plan because however this film series wraps up it will be according to jj abrams vision and those seeds were planted in the production of the force awakens all right so thanks a lot jerry from cleveland for calling in uh cleveland is the hot spot i guess for star wars episode nine speculation you know last week bill we had uh chris from cleveland on the show he's he's a friend of the show so uh, yeah, he, he gets to uh, hang out with Jason, and um, he had some speculation that a lot of people have been buzzing about, quite honestly. You know, I'm, I'm kind of middle of the road on a lot of the things he was saying, but uh, some of it, especially, you know, we've been talking about the Palpatine thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, Chris was definitely definitely leaning in that direction last week when yep. he laid down his uh, heavy, heavily thought out speculation so 
Um, like I said, a lot of people have been talking about it, and I'm seeing Eric from Phoenix. I think Eric is kind of becoming something of a voicemail regular, and uh, he's checking in here, and I think he wants to talk a little bit about Chris's speculation from last week. Hey, Jason. Hey, Jimmy. This is Eric from Phoenix. Just got done listening to the Valentine's Week episode and loved what Chris had to say. Him and I are pretty darn aligned. Um, I've left you guys a couple voicemails where I talked about, you know, uh, Ray being and Han and Leia's daughter. And I connected some of the same things Chris did, although he got way more into the weeds than what I ever did. So I still think that's the case. Well, I was just talking to my wife about this and she goes, no way. Nope. Nope. There's no way. She's not their daughter. Her and Kylo are going to fall in love. That's how he's going to get redeemed. And she goes, she raised totally a nobody. Think back to Anakin. Anakin was a nobody from nowhere um, back in the prequels. Ray is a repeat of Anakin. What if Ray um, was created by a virgin in the Force, just like Anakin? Mm-hmm. That, to me, could be a whole nother um, plausible um reality of where they're going with this now that doesn't explain the skywalker she's not a skywalker however if luke is still in the movie and ben is in the movie you've got skywalkers right there and ray could totally be um like what happened um with anakin um, being created by a virgin in the force anyway something else interesting and my wife gets 100 percent credit for that i never thought about that before and i don't know that you guys have either Oh, so, no. talk to you later. Keep oh, no, we have. Yes, we have. Uh, not to take away anything from your wife uh, out there in Phoenix, Eric, but uh, that's something that I've really been leaning towards since The Force Awakens. I think it would be, you know, a perfect way of bookending the trilogies, the prequel trilogy and the sequel trilogy. You have your Virgins of the Force bringing Anakin Skywalker to life, uh, conceived by the midi chlorians. And you have Ray also, parentless. Um, sure, Kylo acknowledged that she had parents and they're dead now. But what if those parents didn't really realize what was happening? You know, uh, maybe uh, Ray was just kind of conceived by the Force and she she was brought to life by the midi chlorians and the two were, I mean, they were so drunk. They didn't know what was going on. Oh my God. I think I'm pregnant. <laughs> ah, man. Remember the other night, man. Oh man. So <laughs> Cheech and Chong, but you know, I mean, we're so how would they know? How would they know who's, who's impregnating who at this point? They could have been, been, they they could have been adoptive parents. So we have no, I mean, right, we don't right. know who these people were. Yeah, but I mean, why would you adopt a five-year-old just to sell her? Or maybe, maybe they made a deal. Maybe they stole her and then sold stole her. Stole her from who? I don't know. But may, I mean, maybe they were, maybe she was in an orphanage. Maybe, maybe she was in an orphanage or a hospital of some sort as an infant. And the two of them swiped her. But there might be some, some, yeah. Well, oh, well, okay. But th- there might be some kind of story that connects her to the whole saga in, in, a, in a way that, you know, where her parents were, were initially charged with taking care of her, a la Owen and. Yeah, Peru, but yeah. but They'd they like but they okay. you know got wrapped up in in drinking and stuff and completely screwed up their uh, their job. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. The only you know, it, 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 oh gosh, you, <laughs> I know you just try to. Ra- I mean, that was a short little you, voicemail. Ladies and gentlemen, the guy ladies, and gentlemen up like three ladies and gentlemen, I think if you you should be here right now because I think smoke. Literally just came out of Billy Mac's ears. <laughs> uh, I, I didn't say Snoke. I said smoke. All right, go go ahead, Bill. I, it, okay, the idea of Ray being conceived by the Force, a la Anakin. Okay, there's a couple questions there. Number one, is it too much of a rehash? That's the first thing that that I think people would probably react to. Um, I, I wouldn't necessarily rule out the idea if there was some kind of interesting addition to how that actually takes place. You know, we don't know how that happened with Anakin. You know, I mean, maybe, uh, you know, if it happened again with Ray, uh, people in the know in terms of the force uh suddenly became very interested. Oh my god, it happened again. I mean, you know, <laughs> I, that could be tied into the story where we're given more information about about 
you know how the force works. Um, maybe I I'm would just like some kind of yeah something to expand the mythology. Yeah, bit. so I'm not totally opposed to the idea being used again. The only thing is that uh, I think it w- we would accept it less with Ray than Anakin because Anakin was recognized as the beginning of the saga. You know what I mean? And actually, a lot of people didn't accept it all that much then. I mean, I, I remember right, when, right. when that first movie came. There there were groans. I mean, I, I was sitting next to people going, oh, my God, you know, really? What, like a virgin birth? You know, people were commenting. Um, I'll never forget that sitting behind me. What did the guy say? Virgin birth, I think, I think was the comment, you know, groaning. Ah, oh, jeez. Yeah. Oh, man. So Ray comes from the force. I, if, if it could be significant if 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 there's some connective tissue there to the rest of the saga i wouldn't be i wouldn't rule it out necessarily has to happen has to automatically happen. bad has to happen needs to happen has to happen well she is very powerful and there has been no explanation for that yet so none whatsoever so that would give us one we need something we need something this is like yoda's niece or something i don't know give us something for crying out loud now, what about the Ray and Han issue? Do you, do you want the I, Ray and Han issue? Well, not the issue. The the uh, Ray being Han and Leia's daughter. I know you guys talked about you guys talked about that some last week. Right? Yeah, I know, I know. I, you know, I want Ray to have a d- direct connection to the Skywalker family. But, you know, I mean, if we talk about things like Virgins in the Force, then that's not really necessary because she does essentially have that connection to the Skywalker family. She comes from the same place Anakin came from, and Anakin started the whole thing off. So if you have the Force, again, responding in a way that creates life, either as what I think with Anakin had happened was the Sith Lords were using sorcery and Sith alchemy to manipulate the midi-chlorians to create life. And instead, the midi-chlorians reacted defensively, creating Anakin Skywalker. Hmm. So that is where Anakin comes from and why Sidious looks at him when they have that opera house meeting and he said to create life and he looks over at him <laughs> you know um, but i you know sidious doesn't know sidious doesn't know and sidious doesn't know as much as plagueis knew but sidious got greedy and killed plagueis in his sleep before he could fully learn all the secrets and so he believed that with anakin skywalker's strength in the force Working together, the two of them will be able to crack the code and learn how to prevent people from dying and how to avoid death. And so that's where I think Anakin Skywalker comes from in relation to the Force having a counter reaction to the sorcery of the Sith Lords, Plagueis, hmm. and Sidious. Yeah. Well, that's, uh, that's interesting. So, what would have triggered. The creation of Rey. Snoke says the line in The Last Jedi. Uh, Darkness rises and light to meet it. Almost as if he was expecting the Force to react. What if Kylo Ren is not actually Han Solo's son? What if Snoke finally cracked the code himself? The code that Sidious thought he would be able to crack with the help of Anakin Skywalker. A code that we believe had already been cracked by Darth Plagueis, who couldn't pass along the information because Sidious killed him in his sleep. What if Snoke actually figured all that stuff out and was able to create life and he is responsible for the birth of Ben Skywalker nah, or Ben he, Solo. He can't figure it out. Nobody can figure it out. That that's that's my feeling on it. You know that thing when when Palpatine says, you know, some consider it unnatural or yes, whatever. Yes, I, I, that is the truth. Well, the Jedi consider any sort of tapping into the dark side to be unnatural. Well, I, 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 to me, that's not a Jedi issue. That's just a fact. Right. I, I think that that is part of they the theme. They don't practice that religion. Yeah. 
but you can't you don't monkey around with with the divine you're not going to control it it's it's not of this world it's not it you, it's not capable of being used in that way it's just it it because it's it's more powerful than anything else so you know it's it's you know it's you read about this stuff it's the old you know faustian you know type of deal with the devil it just they never work out that's what that is it's once that again theme. my 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 theory is this once again a dark side practitioner was messing around with the force and the midi chlorians but this time was successful and that is what created ben skywalker it wasn't Han. Han was too busy flying around in the galaxy with Chewie anyway, <laughs> going on adventures and hunting Rathars and stuff. He wasn't even around. But Leia somehow gave birth to Ben Solo. They covered it up because that would have been, you know, there could have been some sort of scandalous thing happening. Maybe Leia was, maybe Leia was not faithful to Han and she thinks that the person she was having the affair with is responsible for Ben. But she lies to Han and says that Ben is Han's son. When, in fact, Ben is, his birth was the result of the dark side. And so Ray, her birth was the result of the midichlorians once again having that counter reaction to dark side alchemy and sorcery yeah. well, and, and creating I, the lights. Yeah, Darkness an, rises light to meet it. That's an interesting idea, yeah. I mean, that's now that's out there. The you know, defense. But see, that to me fits in. That, that, that could actually fit in. And I hate, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, I do not like saying into a microphone, Princess Leia was unfaithful to Han Solo. That hurts my feelings a great deal. I, I'm going to have to deal with that on my own. But I'm just spitballing this stuff as it's hitting me right now. And it is. These are theories that I'm really coming up with on the fly. I haven't given it any thought or consideration, but I, I, I like the stuff that's coming out of my mouth right now, so I'm going to just keep talking. <laughs> but no, no, that's like, like, what a jerky thing to say. But that's okay. You know, we're just having fun. We're just spitballing, considering uh, some uh, cool uh, ways that this Skywalker saga can all be tied up and and uh, I'm just trying to fit these puzzle pieces together, like I'm sure Abrams and uh, Chris Terrio and everyone else is trying to figure out. Is and I well, I know they have it figured out by now. They have wrapped shooting for episode nine. It's a wrap, just a day or two ago. Yeah, yeah. And um, so now they got. I think footage is eminent. We're going to be seeing footage soon. I don't know. You know, Star Wars Celebration is still. Two months away. Just they got, they got to go back and shoot all the those insert shots of Chewie's hands that you like so much. Oh, I love it. With the, the they big, still have to do those. The big charcoal mitts, uh, <laughs> those fingers. Um, you know, I, I just don't like looking at Chewie's hands. I think that's kind of weird. Don't, I mean, you never saw his hands in the original <laughs> I trilogy. Just, I find it so funny that this bothers you so much. I was like, I always thought he kind of had paws, you know, not like fingers. Well, they are paws. Well, they're, they're, they're hands. I mean, what they're is fingers. a paw? Well, they're he's digits. got. He has fingers. Yes, they're but digits. He, he always had fingers. There was a Marvel comic once that he's had technologically a, advanced, man. I mean, he's. A I know he is. I know he is. He's. he's a, you ever like, look at a mechanic's hands? They got the grease and oil all over them. They're they're not that far removed. They're, that's what Chewie has. Those are the type of hands Chewie's got. Those are working man's hands. Hey, Jason and Jimmy, this is Matt from Southern California, uh, an unusually wet Southern California at the moment. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to call. This is the first time I'm calling in after all these years. I've been listening to you guys since day one, the very first uh, episode of the Force Cast, and then been following you along really closely all through these years. It's been really awesome. Uh, I just wanted to thank you guys for all you do for, for us Star Wars fans. I grew up with some friends uh, that were all into Star Wars, and then as we got older, uh, they they kind of grew out of it, and I never did. I've always thought you can't outgrow the war. Yeah. So I st- I stuck with it while they've gone on to uh, other Game bigger, of Thrones, better, more boring things. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I just want to thank you guys so much for just being there every week. I look forward to the show every week. But now onto the reason why I called. Uh, onto the spoiler alerts. 
I really appreciate you guys throwing in the spoiler alert as one who wants to stay spoiler free when it comes to uh, specifically episode nine. Uh, but I'm wondering if you guys might think about putting a timer on your spoiler mm. section. I could be making this up, but I feel like this might have been a thing uh, earlier on in the podcast where you guys would do the spoiler alert and yep. then tell the listener that you've got 20 minutes or 10 minutes or something to fast forward if you don't want to hear any spoilers. I think it'd be awesome to bring that back um, because I'm one who's trying to avoid those spoilers, that I, as I said, and I find myself driving in the car and then trying to scrub through the podcast spoiler section to not not hear any spoilers, but also I don't want to miss any content that happens after the spoiler section, and it's, it's uh, kind of tricky because uh, I want to hear all of your show except for the spoilers. So if, if you guys would consider doing that, mm-hmm. I think that'd be awesome, setting a timer for that spoiler section for us. Uh, but, yeah, thanks so much for all you guys do, for really just kind of bringing the family together every week to talk the wars. I think it's really awesome. And, yeah, I'll keep listening as as long as I can because you can't outgrow the wars. Right on. All right, thanks, guys. <laughs> Thank you. That was really nice. That's Thank you cool. for all those yeah. kind words, Matt, from Southern California. Um, good stuff. Okay, so, yes, leading up into the, uh, I think it was the, the Force Awakens, we would do the 15-minute spoiler alert at the end of the show, and we would set a timer and go for 15 minutes and just throw out all the rumors and spoilers, everything that uh, we were reading and hearing, and we'd jam it all into the segment at the end of the show. And then as soon as that timer went off, we would wrap up the show. We would hit the music and say sayonara sometimes we go a little bit longer but wh- why i liked putting it at the end of the show is because then you don't have to skip past anything um unless you're a real diehard and you want to hear a sign off and if you do i i totally thank you for doing that but um uh you know we're not doing any more like discussion about star wars when we're signing off so now i've been hearing a lot from people on facebook at the unofficial Rebel Force Radio Facebook group, uh, some emails to the show, and it's made me consider how we've been a little loosey-goosey with spoilers and rumors throughout the show. So I think we will be reincorporating the 15-minute spoiler alert and placing it at the very end of each episode. Uh, I built. I don't think we got spoilerific on this week's show, did we? I mean... We, I don't I mean, think I so. Think, I think this week's show was all pure speculation. speculation. Yeah, yeah. But uh, there's really not much out there yet. So no, I think they've really screwed yeah, down the lid it seems tight on very this one. Much more tight this time. Way I tight. Think. Way tight. There were no like Ron Howard was tweeting out pictures from the set and stuff. We didn't get any of that from Abrams no. or anyone associated with the film itself. There were some leaked photos featuring Poe and Finn on. Like uh, some grassy plain somewhere. Uh, I, I recall yeah. seeing those. They were with yeah, like last and, spring or something. Yeah, I, I think mean, it's, Naomi it's Ackley was with them mm-hmm. as well. But um, gosh, I don't really recall seeing anything. Of course, we went through some of those leaked character reference photos on last week's show, but those don't spoil anything. Lando's wearing a yellow shirt. Okay, you know, let's move <laughs> on. Um, thrilling to see Billy D back in. Star Wars wardrobe for sure. Oh yeah, and uh, I don't know if this is a spoiler. I hope it's not, but uh, word is is that he'll be using a cane because I think Billy D in real life actually does require the support of a cane. I've noticed his mobility get a little dodgy over the the years. You know, um, unfortunately, that's just you know that's aging. You know, heck, I have arthritis, so trust me, I. I, I know, and, and I can only imagine when I'm in my 80s, like Billy D. Williams is, I'll probably not be moving around half as well as he is. But I just love the distinction of the Baron Administrator from Cloud City walking around with a cane. I just love that. Well, he won't. I don't even think. It probably won't be referred to as a cane. It'll be like a scepter, yeah. you know? <laughs> oh, yeah. He's <laughs> Star Wars royalty. Billy D. Of course, you can follow us uh, at the Rebel Force Radio channel on YouTube. And we have a playlist of the Billy D. Quote of the Week. So we're uh, compiling all the 
greatest Billy D quotes of the week from all the way back to the beginning. And we are uh, throwing them out there on the YouTube channel. We're also putting up uh, some great bits from our past, RFR Rewind, the Filoni Files featuring highlights from our conversations with Dave Filoni over the years. And coming soon in the Cantina, Star Wars interviews are going to be made available on the RFR YouTube channel. So those are exclusive interviews that Jason and myself have conducted with cast and crew of all different productions of Star Wars over the years. And so we're gathering all those interviews together, and we're going to be dropping them on their own playlist at the Rebel Force Radio YouTube channel. You can go to youtube.com slash Rebel Force Radio and subscribe and ring the button, and you will be getting notifications about every time we drop new content on the YouTube channel. And uh, great stuff coming up this week. Of course, I also want to give a big shout out to our Patreon audience, members of the RFR Patreon community. It's just such a great place to hang and meet other listeners of the show. Uh, Of course, great exclusives like Patreon early access to live events like RFR Live in Chicago coming this April. Even an exclusive Patreon podcast event happening Saturday, April 13th in Chicago that only RFR Patreon members will have access to. You guys will get first crack of the tickets. The uh, remainder will go on sale publicly, but RFR Patreon members will get a discount for the exclusive night. Now, for our big live event, which is happening Thursday night at the convention, April 11th, tickets you're going to have to buy in advance from the venue itself, actually, And uh, those will be $25 in advance, $30 at the door. But we anticipate these events will sell out quickly. You are not going to want to hesitate at all. It's RFR Live in Chicago at Reggie's, 2105 South State Street, April 11th. Doors at 8 p.m., podcasts at 9 p.m., 21 and over only, please. It's going to be an incredible night. Can't wait to see you there. Tickets are on sale now at Reggie'sLive.com. For links and other RFR updates, be sure to check in with our official website, rebelforceradio.com, our new official Twitter account, at RFR Rebel Force on Twitter, and uh, we're also on Instagram. I'm I'm still just trying to warm up to Instagram, guys. I'm all thumbs with Instagram. I don't even know what I'm supposed to be doing with it. (laughs) I I have like eight posts. (laughs) You know, it's like, come on, man. So I'm cracking a whip on myself to learn more about Instagram and uh, make that a good place for you to get Rebel Force Radio news. Of course, the Facebook page, facebook.com slash Rebel Force Radio, is always really solid. And I have been jumping in on the conversation at the unofficial Rebel Force Radio Facebook group. And that's a group that you have to get permission to join. So uh, the moderators there, they uh, are, are they definitely... Uh, keep everything on a tight leash. So, <laughs> you know, I get away with what I can over there too, but they, they do a great job over there. And I'm, I'm so grateful and thankful for that group of rebel force radio listeners. And I always like jumping into the fray with you guys. And I've been doing a lot more of it lately and it's been a lot of fun. It's been really great, man. I've just been having a good time uh, hanging and banging with you guys there on Facebook, on Twitter. And yes, Slowly but surely, Instagram. There is a, a Rebel Force Radio uh, Reddit. Uh, somebody just sent me an email about that. We have nothing to do with that, although uh, we do approve it. Um, here's one. Somebody mentioned me in a thread. Oh, okay, let's see what this is. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, uh, guys, you don't I, even know what you're getting into. Uh, I'm, an, I'm an old dude, you know. <laughs> Reddit, Reddit for me is like, okay, where's the best online site to interact with both the guys and RFR fans? Well, that's pretty cool um, that someone's asking that uh, at the uh, unofficial RFR subreddit. Um, like I said, you know, typically Facebook, but you can always send us an email, show at rebelforceradio.com. And I jump into that from time to time as well, too. And I like to talk to people. Uh, the Facebook page, like I said, is always great. Um I'm just looking here at this uh, subreddit to see what people are saying. Uh, They're all being very helpful here. That's nice. Um, We should be getting Jason and Jimmy to maybe 
promote the sub on the show. It could help it grow. And that says Obi Wank Kenobi. <laughs> Interesting. Obi Wank. Obi Wank. That's the... Oh, they you know, they do need more subscribers here. It's okay, so this is the subreddit for I don't even know what that means. Um on Reddit. This is it's um what is the website? Uh, Reddit.com slash R slash Rebel Force Radio. So that's what you want to check out. Reddit.com slash R slash Rebel Force Radio. Uh, maybe we'll I'll put up a, a link on our official website. Um, but like I said, I don't even know what I'm doing in here with Reddit. So, um, you know, guys, uh, baby steps. Baby steps with the old dude, okay? You know? <laughs> <laughs> but I'll talk Star Wars with anyone. And uh, always have and always will. Well, somebody must have told him about my little maneuver at the Battle of Ten Ab. Bogullet can feel your thoughts.